Well, good morning, First Baptist Mansfield. And good morning to our guests. Let me rush to um, express my gratitude to you this morning for allowing me to bring God's word in the absence of our pastor, Dr. Spencer Plumley. So I want to thank you for that. My grandmother had a phrase that she would often say. She would say, God don't like ugly. Whenever she would hear about someone talking to someone wrong or doing someone something wrong, she would say, God don't like ugly. By stating this, she was communicating that God is righteous and that he detests, he's displeased with men's sinful and wicked acts. And furthermore, she was implying that he will avenge the person by having the wicked person get what is coming to him or to her, whether he does it directly or allows it by permission. I'm reminded of an incident in Acts chapter 23 during the trial of the apostle Paul. Paul, having been arrested for preaching the resurrection, Paul has an opportunity to defend himself before the Sanhedrin council. During his opening arguments, Paul gives his defense and he utters these words. Brothers, I have lived my life before God in all good conscience to this day. Paul's statement was implying that he was being falsely accused of the charges that were being brought against him. Consequently, the high priest Ananias, who was standing by, ordered those to strike Paul in the face. And to this, Paul replied. Paul says, God is going to strike you. You whitewashed wall. You are sitting there judging me according to the law, and yet in violation of the law, are you ordering me to be struck? It should not be of any surprise that Paul's prophetic words came to pass when the Jews murdered Ananias just 10 years later. Why? Why was it not a surprise? Because God don't like ugly. In the same way, today, believers are called to have confidence in God that he would help them when faced with the onslaught of evil attacks from others, and he would vindicate them to the wicked person. Now, keep in mind, church, we're in the book of Psalms. In the book of Psalms, these Psalms are meant to be sung, are meant to be uttered in worship towards God. I like the way one person defined worship. They define worship this way, that worship is simply looking in the right direction up towards God. But I wonder, my brothers and sisters today, when we are faced with the attack of others, do we often find ourselves looking around rather than looking up? Psalms 5 is traditionally has been classified as a psalm of individual lament or a psalm of innocence. But also at times it's a psalm of imprecatory, meaning that it invokes judgment on particular people. This psalm here alternates between three petitions and three motivations for those petitions. And the themes that run through those petitions are this. The psalmist's relationship with God and the wicked people's opposition to God. And although traditionally David has been um, attributed to this psalm, we have no definitive information that exists regarding the date and the specific circumstances of the psalms. However, it can very well be that Psalm 5 is to be read in the same way of Psalms 3 and four, David is on the run after his son kills Amnon for raping his half-sister Tamar. And, but not long after that, his son turns, Absalom turns around and brings up a revolt against David, his father, so much so that he is led into exile. 
Many people that was in David camp, they shifted, and now they're on Absalom's side, and they are against him. And the opposition comes so strong that we find these words in Psalms 3, verse 2. David says, many are saying of me, God will not deliver him. This appears to be the most likely circumstance. But even if this is not the circumstances of Psalms 5, and it just finds its way here, in the Bible, in this position, the message of Psalms 5 is clear and simple, and here it is. The righteous can confidently appeal to God for deliverance and protection from the attacks of the wicked because of who God is. In other words, God don't like ugly. But what does praying to God with confidence look like when you are under attack? What does praying to God look like? How should it look when you and I are faced with the untruthfulness, the the slander, and the attacks of others? The psalmist answers our question today through these three petitions. And notice the first petition that David offers up in his prayer as he's in the same situation. He voices a prayer to God for help, a prayer to God for help. Notice with me, go to the text, the language of the psalm is here. He says, listen, consider, pay attention to, listen, hear my words, the things that I utter to you, God. Consider, discern the things that I am saying. He says, give ear to my words, O Lord. Consider my groan, groanings. Consider my groanings. Also understood as meditations. Here it comes from the same root word that we find only in Psalms 39 and 3. It's this idea of meditation, nonverbal expressions. He says, God, hear what I say, but sometimes because the weight of the situation, sometimes because of the gravity of the situation, sometimes because of the burden of the situation, I don't know what to pray for. So just hear my groanings, hear my meditations. Paul says in Romans chapter 8, verse 26, the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And here's the situation here today that David is Uh, Between a rock and a hard plate, these people are coming down on him. They're making accusations against him, so much so that David cries out and he says, God, listen to me. He prays this with boldness and he says, listen to me, consider my groanings. Not only that, he says, listen, God, consider. But then he also says, pay attention. Heed the sound of my cry for help. Not probably literal crying, but he is actually crying. He's pleading out to God for help. My king and my God. The psalmist acknowledges where the answer of his prayer is going to come from. The statement here is both an affirmation of the psalm's trust in God and a declaration of the sovereignty of God. He knows that his help is going to come from God, but it's only God that who can help him. And notice what he says. He says, my king and my God, for to you I pray. Although David is a king and he possesses a kingdom, he says, but if you are my king and you are my God and it's to you that I pray. He has faith in God, not in people. People have already let him down, not in the circumstances not in his resources, but he has faith in God. He prays this with boldness. He's not ordering God, but he's praying. He's going before the throne of grace with boldness, and he's saying, listen, God, consider God, and pay attention to me, God. But not only that, he prays with expectation. He prays with expectation. Notice in verse 3, he says, in the morning, O Lord, You will hear my voice. In the morning, I will order my prayer to you and eagerly watch in the morning. Now, he is not saying here that the only time a person should be praying 
is in the morning or that someone has to actually get up and have to have a time of prayer in the morning, although that is a good thing, that's a great thing, it's a recommended thing, but he is saying in the morning, right? He's going to have a good night's sleep, but in the morning, he is going to make up his mind and set his mind towards the Lord. Not only that, it's frequently equated the idea that in the morning comes a renewed hope in the life of the believer. We see this many times throughout the Bible, Psalms 46 and 5 and Psalms 30 as well. And most often probably quoted and one that you understand the most is, the hear the most, is Psalms 30 and 5, and it goes like this. For anger is but a moment. His favor is for the lifetime, but weak, weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. And so David is saying, listen, in the morning, there's going to be a renewed hope, God, and I am going to pray to you. And he says, he's going to pray. He says, I'm going to declare to you. I'm going to uh, set in order my prayer. This idea here of setting in order is in, in the Hebrew, it's the same as the, how the priests, when they did sacrifices, they would set in order um, to start the fight. They would set in order the sacrifice in the same way in Genesis chapter 22, verse 9. The Bible says that when Abraham went to offer up Isaac and when he got there, he set in order he put in order, he placed in order the logs, the sacrifice before God. And in the same way, the psalmist is saying, listen, I'm seeing this as an act of worship. Notice that. He's under attack, but yet he's praying for God for help, and he's seeing this as an act of worship, to come to the Lord and to beseech the Lord in his behalf for help. And he's praying with expectation here. It says, in the morning I will order my prayer to you and eagerly watch. Eagerly watch literally means to look up. We just declared that. Worship, rightly done, is looking up in the right direction. He says, I'm going to pray and I'm going to look up to you, God, and wait. David prays to God for help. And notice his motivation as we look in verses 4 through 6, his motivation for this. Why would David pray to God for help? We know who God is, but specifically here, it's because of God's character. God's character. He is one who abhors evil. The psalmist affirms God's righteous character at least three times here by mentioning his hatred for evil. Notice what the psalmist says. For you are not a God who delights in in wickedness. Evil cannot dwell in you. In other words, God has no pleasure, takes no pleasure in wickedness. God is not pleased by it, and there's no part of evil that God will tolerate. Just as a side note, and you often see this in believer, unbelievers, but sometimes you see this in believers. Every now and then, people think they can approach God and they want to do a little uh, type of they come to God and they want to make a, a deal with God. And the deal is predicated on some type of sin. God, if you will allow me to go there, I'll go to church. God, if you allow me to do this just once, I promise that I'll never do it again. But shame on us if we ever do that. We expect that of the wicked person, but shame on us if we ever do that because we are going to God and we're insinuating that God is a person who can tolerate and entertain and house guests, house sin as a guest. But not David. David says, listen, I pray to God for help because I know his character. He is a God who does not delight in wickedness and evil cannot dwell in his presence. Not only that, he says, listen, the boastful shall not stand before your eyes. You hate all who do iniquity. They're boastful. They're prideful. They exalt themselves independently of God. And we find similar language here in Psalms chapter 1, verse 5. Where the psalmist says, therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor in the sinners, in the assembly of the righteousness. In other words, God is not going to allow people to stand before him who are wicked and righteous, unrighteous. Notice what he says. 
The boastful shall not stand before your eyes. You hate all who do iniquity. You destroy those who speak falsehood. The Lord abhors the man of bloodshed and of deceit. This thirsty man, this bloodthirsty man. Not only does the Lord hate them, he does something about them. They are exterminated. They are blotted out. This is with the character of God. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 16 through 19 says these words. The Lord hates six things. In fact, seven are detestable to him. Arrogant eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that plots wicked schemes, Feet eager to run to evil, a lying witness who gives false testimony, and one who stirs up trouble among brothers. Keep in mind what we're talking about here. Although David is um, feeling the onslaught of the attack, he's primarily describing God's relationship to evil rather than the, the behavior of the wicked. He's going to get there. And as a result, the psalmist prays to God with boldness and with expectancy. What about you today? When you are faced with the onslaught of others, when they say things about you at school, young people, when somebody's gossiping and saying things about you and lying on you, how do you respond? Others, when you are at work and you hear there's rumors going around that you said this and you've done that and those things are not true, how do you respond? Many of us, we don't call on the help of the Lord. We try to call on the help of our friend. We try to call on the help of something and someone else. But let me suggest to you today that you should call upon the help of the Lord. And I know that this is, listen, we are human and this is what happened. I can remember one time working at a a store and I would try to preach the gospel um, to individuals. And so they knew that I was a Christian. And there was this one guy came up to me and he wanted me to um, bring him home because uh, his car was broke for some time. And I'm, I'm a, listen, like it or not, I'm a probably straight up person. I tell you exactly what I'm feeling. I try to do it in niceness. And so I told him, I said, listen, I'm going to bring you home tonight. But I'm not going to bring you home anymore after that because I heard you bragging about smoking, spending $200 on cigarettes. I heard you bragging about buying Monster and Powerade. And listen, you need to take that money and fix your car. Because in the same way, when I get paid, I pay a car note, right? I don't have the luxuries you have. So in the same way, I need you to do that. And the guy said, okay, right? And so, consequently, he went back and told other people on the job. And you can tell when people want to get something off their chest, right? I was kind of serving as the the lead manager at that point. It wasn't the head manager, and the head manager left me in control. And and so that day, I, I told a young lady, I said, hey, can you change the signs on the the refrigerators, it was at Sears Home Appliance. Can you change the signs on the refrigerators before the customers come in? Were you always telling us what to do? You're not a Christian. Now, where did that come from? (laughs) Right? But there was this conversation going on behind my back, right? And I wanted to retaliate and get in her face and let her know where she was going because she really wasn't a Christian. But then I'm reminded of what my wife says, right? My wife says, remember, you got a testimony. You can't do those type of things, right? But do we go to the Lord for help when we're in those situations when people are launching these attacks to us? I want to submit to you and give you this word. Prayer needs to be our first response and not our last result. Once again, prayer needs to be our first response and not our last result, right? Well, we've done just about everything. I guess we will pray. As if it's something bad, right? Where it should be our first response. In the time of need, David calls to the Lord for help. That's his first petition. The second petition builds upon that. 
Notice what, uh, what it is. The second petition here, he prays to God for righteous guidance. David says, listen, I'm in this situation, God, and I'm calling for your help, but I need to know how to respond, how you would have me to respond. And notice the psalmist's second petition. He prays to God with reverence. Notice the Bible in verse 7. But as for me, by your abundant loving kindness, I will enter your house. At your temple, I will bow in reverence to you. I will enter your house with your faithful loving kindness. Here is a declaration to enter the Lord's house, and it's both literal and metaphoric, right? Here the word uses, it speaks to the, this earthly tabernacle that he is entering. But metaphorically, it is speaking um, broadly to the presence of the Lord, the Lord allowing someone into his presence. While it is true that wicked people, unsaved people, and saved people can come into an earthly tabernacle, can come into this church, and they can sit down and they can pretend to worship and do all those things. However, only the saved person can come into the presence of God. That is the consolation prize that you have, that when you need God in the time of help, you can go into his presence and ask for righteous guidance. That's why he acknowledged that he's able to come before God, not on his righteousness, but on the righteousness of God. He is accepted, but only because of God. And this is a, a good place to just say way and say this here. In the same way, you and I who are standing here today, if you are saved and bought with the blood of Jesus, it's because of the grace of God. That is the offer of the gospel, that you come not based upon your righteousness, not based upon what you are trying to do, but because of the forgiveness and the faithing, loving, kindness, mercy of God. You are able to come into his presence you're able to be saved because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if you've never made a decision to put, uh, make Jesus Christ the Lord of your Savior, to put your trust and faith in Jesus, today we would love to have a conversation with you about how that looks and what are the next steps. Just meet myself or someone else in the back of the sanctuary after this service uh, in our next step area. The psalmist says, listen, I enter your house with from your loving kindness, faithfulness. He says, I bow down towards your holy temple in reverential awe of you. He does this in reverence. Again, he's asking God for his righteousness, not his own. And notice what he says in verse 8. Make your way straight before me. Remove any, any hindrances, any temptations that I may follow, that I may follow you. The object of the psalmist's life here is God, not his circumstances. Often when we are put in those situations and people are coming against us, we need to learn how to respond. And the way that we respond, we ask for God's guidance. Not to be led by our own actions. Oh, I'll just punch him in the face. I mean, that's what you're thinking. That's what you want to do, right? Well, I'll just go back and I'll tell something on them that somebody doesn't know. And mine will be truthful, so I'm justified. And if you're in a position of authority, you say, well, I'll just fire them, right? I'll find some reason I'll just fire them because I hold control over them. No, we need to go to God and righteous God is, God, how would you have me to act? And that's what the psalmist here is saying. It's synonymous with God leading the righteous in his way. Here we see that the closer you and I get to God, the more aware we are of our sin, just like we are aware of others' sin. And I would also say the closer we get to God, our attention should be less on the sins of individuals and more on the righteousness of Christ. The psalmist says that he's Pray to God for a righteous guidance. But notice his motivation for this reason. Why does he need guidance from the God? Because of the attacks 
of their speech, because of the text of their speech. Notice in verse 9, O oh Lord, in verse 9, there is nothing reliable in what they say. Right? Nothing reliable. They're not trustworthy. The destruction is within them. Their throat is an open grave. They flatter with their tongues. They're not reliable. They're absent of truth. Their destruction, their inner emotions are no good. Their throat is like an open grave. The death comes out of, out of them. In other words, these people are not saved. They're wicked, no good, unbelieving. They're just no good save people. They flatter with their words. They deceive individuals. And the thing about these individuals, not only do they flatter, they flatter with their words, but their words are so deceptive that it will, in, in literal sense, um, bring a person to ruins. And that's what David is facing here. Notice, he's the king of a kingdom. And you have the king on the run with the attack of all these words and the things that people are saying. And the psalmist sets up an indictment against them. He says, they're no good, they're good for nothing, flatterer words, there's death within them. God, based upon this, I need your guidance. I'm not going to try to fight this thing on my own. I need your guidance. When faced with the attack of others, do you ask God for righteous guidance? Or do you look for a way to retaliate? I'll make sure I get you. People will say, I don't want to lose my religion, as if you can really lose your religion. In other words, though, what they're implying, what they are communicating is, listen, I really want to do something that's not consistent with God. These jokers have the nerve to talk about me like this and to lie on me. I just want to go all off on them. Don't let your emotions be an excuse for you not to walk in the guidance of God. The Bible says that be angry and sin not. You don't have to like what people are doing about you, but you should not respond in sin, but rather respond by drawing closer to God for his help. And in the words of my wife, remember, you got a testimony, right? You have a testimony. Now, I don't want you to think I'm just some bad person, but there are certain times that when people do certain things, you know, I, I, my wife can see the, the wheels are turning. I remember one time we were at, at, at Disney World, and Abby was trying to walk up. I don't know if Abby even remember this. And she was so young. She was trying to walk up to this little kiosk. And the man just ran, oh, it ran and hit her. Um, and so quick, I don't, I don't think my wife was there. My mother-in-law was there. Who was here today? And I said, hey! Right? And then I was like, I need to pray for the guidance of God. Right? That's my baby, man. He almost just knocked my baby down like this big grown guy, right? And so in those situations, when people are talking about you and people are coming against you, people are doing things against you, you need the guidance of God. You need to go into God's presence. You need to go to God, right? And realize that, listen, I'm a sinner too. They're a sinner. I'm a sinner. And listen, I want you, God, to guide me and to lead me in such a way that I may be a person that live my testimony towards you. David. In his situation, he prays for help from God. And then he goes on and he prays for righteous guidance from God. But then notice this last, he prays to God for resolution. Well, remember, David called for help. So it has to be a resolution about this thing. And I dealt with myself, God, and I pray for your guidance because I want to continue to follow you even in the midst of this situation that I don't change and I don't become like those same people that I'm talking about, that I can draw closer to you. But then he prays for a resolution. Notice how the psalmist requests a swift verdict about the situation. First, he prays for the judgment for the wicked. The judgment for the wicked. Notice what he says. Hold them guilty, O God. By their own devices, let them fall in the multitude of their transgression. Thrust them out for they are rebellious against you. Hold them guilty. Punish them. He's declaring a guilty sentence upon them, and he's calling God to act according to his righteousness. Let them fall. In other words, these people are setting up their own traps, and yet 
they find themselves falling into their own schemes. It's like when we look at these cartoons or we look at these movies and someone sets a trap for someone and the person walks right past the trap after even step in it and keep going and then the person comes and they say, well, listen, I thought I set that thing pretty good and they go over and they look at it and then they try to step in it just to make sure and they end up pulling themselves in their very own trap. And you have that depiction here that these people are laying in wait for David, but yet he's saying, listen, let them be brought down by their own schemes. All right, now here opens up a question. Preacher, are you saying that we can pray impeccatory prayers on people? Because if that's the case, I got a whole list. I was like, rain down fire on them, right? It's not what I'm saying. I would answer a yes and a no. Hear me out. I would answer a yes and a no. The key to the answer is in 10 part D when he says they rebelled against you. David is only praying according to the righteousness of God. And he's taking issue not in personal revenge, but because they are rebelled against a holy God, albeit it's directed on them. They're, they're caught, he's caught up in the middle of it. They have um, sinned against God and his righteous people. Here the psalmist is praying according to God's righteousness. You find something similar in Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. If you have your place, you can go there. If not, I can read it for you. But in Romans chapter 10, the Apostle Paul, he's talking about this idea of, of, of Israel being in a, in a place where they are disheartened because God has handed them over to a, a heart and mind that the Gentiles may be grafted in. And so here in Romans chapter 10, we find Paul saying these words, Romans chapter 10, verses 7 through 11. Look what Paul says. What then that Israel is seeking, it has not obtained, but those who were chosen obtained it, and the rest were hardened. Just as it was written, God gave them a spirit of, of stupor, eyes to see, not um, eyes to see, not and ears not to hear, and down to this very day. And this is what he says. He quotes an impeccable um, psalm, impeccatory psalm. And David says, let their table, Psalm 69, let their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a retribution to them. Let their eyes be darkened to see not and, and bend their backs forever. But don't stop there. Look at what Paul says in verse 11. I say then, they did not stumble so as to fall, did they? In your Bible, it may read, they have not stumbled so far in the fact that they're not out of God's grace, that they can't return. So when you pray a prayer like this, and although David is being open and honest for us, your prayer needs to be a prayer that they fall to the scheme so they can be helped and so that they can stop doing what they're doing, but at the same time that they can be helped, that they can change their ways, and ultimately they have not gone so far that they can come back to God. We're not praying for someone to be doomed to hell forever. We're praying that in their ways, Satan will use them, he will buffer them, they will find all type of problems out there, and ultimately they will come back in, and they will come and be saved. That's what we're talking about here. He calls for a swift, swift judgment on the wicked. But notice also, after he calls for swift judgment on the wicked, wicked, he's calling for this resolution, he's calling for the reward for the righteous the reward for the righteous. In verse 11, he says, but let all who take refuge in you be glad. Let them ever sing for joy and may, your shel may you shelter them that those who love your name may exult in you. The psalmist declares that the ones who take shelter, back in verse 7, they're rejoicing forever. There's a joy that needs to be with the person who is in Christ. That's the difference between a person who is saved and a person 
who is not saved. They're going about trying to do things their own way. They're wicked. They're trying to accomplish these schemes by their own, by their own uh, might and strength. But yet we turn to the Lord and we ask him for help and we find joy in the presence of God. And notice what David says in verse 12. For you, Lord, you bless the righteous man, O Lord. You surround him with favor as with a shield. The shield that he is explaining here is not a, a, a small shield, but a shield that encompasses and it protects the whole person's body, a military shield. And so in the same way, the psalmist is saying, listen, I'm protected. I'm delivered from this situation. I understand, God, that you are here to help me. Then even though it may seem like help is not coming, it may seem like these people are against me, and it may seem like that I'm going to lose my job. It may seem like I'm going to be put out of school. It may seem like I'm going to lose my friends. I know that you are a shield all around me. I can have confidence. We can have confidence today because we know when we call upon God with help, we know that we can seek him for righteous guidance, and we know that he is going to bring about a resolution to our situation one way or another. The spirit of the Psalms, of the psalmist here, is not new to us. There are many who have been in this situation. Joseph was in this situation with his brothers. Job was in this situation with his friends. And there's more and more that can we can go on about. But I like to just reflect upon Jesus. How Jesus was in this situation when he had people lying about him, he had people spitting on him, he had people saying crucify him, lying saying that he had blasphemed. The Bible lets us know that he didn't get off the cross. He didn't strike them dead, but yet he prayed for them. And he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. In other words, he entrusted himself to God. And in the same way, because Christ has entrusted himself to God, we can entrust ourselves to Christ. That's why I'm glad here today the Bible says, therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession, let us hold fast our confidence, for we do not have a great high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace in a time of need. My brothers and sisters, today, whoever is attacking you, I don't know what it is, whatever you are going through that you think there are people, there are circumstances that are coming upon you, you can have confidence that you can call upon the Lord for help. You need to pray to the Lord and be confident that he will protect you. Why? Because God don't like ugly. Can I pray for you? Our Father and our God, we're just thankful here today. We are thankful for this time that you have allowed us to walk into the shoes of the psalmist. And although we don't know the specific situation, Father, we know that in common there's nothing new, that people have always attacked the people of God, the righteousness of God. And so if we find ourselves here today in that situation, there's help for us today. I pray that you will move upon our heart and allow us to call upon you, God. I also pray, Father, if there's someone here today that has never accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, they can't call for help. They can't call for guidance. There's no protection for them because they are not in your wings. They're not protected by your wings. We pray that they will enter into that relationship today. Now, quicken their hearts and their spirits and allow them to answer today. If they don't know Christ, they will come this day and put their trust and faith in Christ. Those that have walked back from you, God, they find themselves 
doing things in their own strength, but not in your guidance. Let them come back as well today. Although they're saved, let them renew their strength in you and fall into your protection and rely upon your guidance. God, we love you today, and we thank you for all that has transpired. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.